So thanks uh, everyone for uh, attending. This is, I think, a great opportunity to talk about an important um, topic. So we still have people joining as we speak. Um, all the panelists are here. Um, well, the last panelist is just jumping on now. So uh, yeah, it's all uh, just in time organization, but it, I think can work well. Um, well, let's start perhaps with a quick round of um, introductions. Uh, so uh, Alice, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Alice um, Richardson. Um, I'm autistic and I was actually only diagnosed um, earlier this year. And um, like many people have a, a, a history with the mental health system, um, both here and in the UK. Um, and um, I also have a, a son as well. Um, he is not diagnosed um, as autistic, but you know, it's obviously something that I'm um, mindful of and um, I think in part, obviously, that's why I'm, I feel quite strongly about um, ABA and, and um, having this discussion. Mm -hmm. okay. Laura, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Dilley. I'm a professor at Michigan State University in the USA. Uh, I am uh, a professor in uh, speech, language, and hearing bioscience also a neurodiversity advocate and someone with neurodivergent traits. So great to be here, thank you. Mm -hmm. And we've got uh, Rory. Hi, my name's Rory. Uh, I'm from New Zealand also. Uh, I am an online advocate and researcher for autism and ADHD. Uh, I am autistic and have ADHD, OCD, dysgraphia and dyscalculia. Um, so quite a lot of things. Uh, yeah, and uh, I didn't get ABA, but I got the other version of ABA, which was just parenting ABA, so. Mm -hmm. um, Kim, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, and sorry about the confusion with the, the date. Currently on mute, I think. Okay, so I'm Kim Crawley. I work as a cybersecurity researcher and writer. I, I just started a new job with Hack the Box. And uh, I'm, I'm autistic and I'm ADHD. And because of my age and generation, I never went through formal ABA, thank goodness. But um, but yeah, I've been through the same sort of childhood and life trauma that the vast majority of autistic people have been through. Mm -hmm. Very good. So we're still waiting for Pip Carroll to, to join us. She's uh, based in Australia, so it's very early in the day. And, and she said she wanted to jump on. Um, I think we can... Um, maybe in the interest of not losing time, just uh, make a start. And Alice, if you just uh, perhaps help me monitor you know, people who continue to want to join, in particular um, Pip, then uh, please admit her and we'll give her an introduction as well. So as a, anyone who um, hasn't uh, uh, come across my name, so uh, I'm based in New Zealand as well. Uh, I'm, autistic um, and well, for the last few years have been involved in, in activism around um, autistic people, in particular uh, autistic people, uh, how we're treated in the workplace, psychological safety basically is, is a core topic that I've come to see as of being of critical importance. Um, so I don't have any direct experience of ABA. I mean, I stayed clear of that right from the, the, the start. Uh, I was, and so it was really important for me to uh, 
yeah, get the right kind of panelists involved here, some of whom I think may have closer experience with ABA. Um, so, uh, and what we've done is we've prepared a list of questions that we'll go through, uh, read them out, and then everyone has a chance to uh, respond to these uh, questions. Um, we'll try to get through, uh, if we're lucky, we'll get through to six questions, uh, which are, I think, big questions. Uh, and then there are further panels that we are coordinating in the coming weeks. So this is only just the start of ongoing discussions about this topic, because I think we can um, make further progress uh, based on the, the excellent uh, campaigning that has been done um, by the uh, LGBTQ uh, communities uh, and with where we're now seeing uh, globally and, and multiple jurisdictions, we are seeing bans on conversion therapies. And, and really, I mean, what we are talking about here is I think uh, coming to more comprehensive bans, uh, acknowledging that it's actually uh, not just the, the target group uh, that is in question, but it's the, the kinds of techniques uh, that have been used and, and, and the objectives of, the, of these uh, so-called therapies. Um, so um, let's get started. Um, the first question is designed to um, give listeners and, and viewers an introduction uh, to this topic. So it, it's a simple question. Please describe what is ABA therapy and how is it implemented? What are the underlying assumptions about how to nurture good interpersonal relationships? Um, Anyone want to start on that? I guess I will. Um, ABA was actually the precursor to what later became gay conversion therapy. And so it all has the same root, this awful evil man behaviorist, I believe named Ivor Lovas, who believed that autistic people were not human. And he even blatantly said that. Uh, he believed that, you know, we didn't have thoughts or feelings. And that's the evil, evil behaviorism. It's all about, you're just your behaviors. You don't have thoughts, you don't have feelings, you don't have complex motivations for what you do. You don't have intrinsic motivations. You are just a combination of behaviors to be rewarded or punished. And some of Lovas's punishments were especially brutal and violent, and some really violent uh, ABA approaches are still practiced today, especially at the Judge Rotenberg Center with the co constant electrocution, which is incredibly disturbing. Um, modern ABA practitioners will often claim, oh, well, ABA has changed, but there are multiple problems with that. Like, first of all, you know, their organization still holds the Judge Rotenberg Center in high regard and Lovas in high regard. And the other problem is even if you're rewarding someone for behaving a certain way, it, it causes the same problems. You, you don't uh, do things due to your own motivation. You need some sort of external source saying, do this, do that, don't do this. And I've heard that with enough ABA abuse, your you, you learn that your body doesn't belong to you. Your life doesn't belong to you. You do not act without someone else telling you how to act. And it causes PTSD. It makes kids more vulnerable to sexual predators because they don't learn to assert themselves and they learn that their bodies don't belong to them. And it's just all completely disturbing. And like gay conversion and trans conversion therapy uses the same philosophy and techniques, just replace autistic behaviors with supposedly gay or transgender behaviors or gender non-conforming behaviors. Excellent introduction. Um, anyone want to, to add to, to this introduction? Um, I'll just add to that is that, yeah, that's, that is um, a very good um, summary of ABA. 
I think that the, the tricky thing about it is that now, um, as you mentioned, modern ABA practitioners, they um, do a lot of things to cover up what is essentially that same idea of, of trying to make an autistic person be and look like a non-autistic person. So the, the core idea is that being autistic is incorrect and we need to change the way that we present ourselves. Otherwise we're wrong or, you know, it means that we are upset or sad when in actual fact that is frequently not the case. And um, yeah, there's a lot of renaming going on and using different labels on what is essentially the same, you know, yeah. set of principles. Yeah. Um, Rory, I'm, I'm keen on your perspective. I mean, you, you mentioned that you've experienced uh, ABA basically as part of the parent and that, that you were exposed to. I think this, this might also be a useful perspective because it uh, ties uh, the whole sort of underlying motivation to parenting techniques. Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing that Kim and Alice have both touched on is the fact that it's based on external behavior. So there's never any consideration to your autonomy or your like personal feelings or your motivations for doing the things that you do. So at the dinner table, the dinner table was basically peak ABA for me. Um, sit still, don't like use this fork, don't talk, don't talk too much, like don't watch TV, don't do this. And yeah, I had a stepmother that just used to stare at me for the entire time that I ate waiting for me to make an error. Um, and then I'd be punished. So yeah, ended up with eating issues, surprisingly, um, which is an, another thing that's super common. Um, but yeah, I mean, the it basically teaches you that you should live for other people. That is the, the biggest danger for it is that you don't matter. And like most of us who found out and later in life that we were autistic, you basically have a crisis of conscience. I mean, sorry, a crisis of identity because you're like, wait, who am I? Like I've been living for everyone else for so long. Like, and then you realize that this is what's happened. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking hearing like women in their sixties going, I, I don't know if I'll actually ever know who I am. And, and it's because they've been robbed of their agency. So uh, I think it's just, it's, it, it, it is an, an completely inhumane, no matter how positive it looks from the outside. Yeah, I, I think that's a very astute observation. And, and, and uh, uh, I think we can probably, well, you can, uh, tell me if you disagree, but I think every autistic person intuitively knows that the ABA approach is fundamentally wrong and dehumanizing. Um, and uh, of course, the and I think this may be a reason why um, uh, people like Eva Lovas resorted to saying, oh, well, those people are not human, right? Because I mean, if we claim our humanity, I mean, that's, being, that's, that's rejected. So I see Pip Carroll has, has joined. Uh, Pip, can you hear us? It would be great to get yes, a can... brief introduction from you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, sorry, I'm just, I've been, I've spent the last five minutes trying to get my video to work, but I've changed computers recently and it doesn't seem to be working. My apologies. Oh, <laughs> um, yes, I well, I sort of thought I'd join this meeting mostly as an observer because I'm kind of new to the world of autistic advocacy. Um, well, I suppose I'm 45 years into the world of autistic experience being um, self-diagnosed autistic myself after having an experience of... Um, going through a process of diagnosis of my own children. And then that very familiar process of reflection, I think everyone does when they look back and they realize, oh yes, well, my nephews are autistic and all my parents are autistic and my grandparents were probably autistic. And why is it such a surprise that I am? <laughs> um, <laughs> it was, uh, so yeah, I've been in the last couple of years, I suppose. Um, thinking about that in terms of contextualizing my life. And I think some of the things you were saying earlier, Rory, were really interesting um, because I do very much relate to that sense of patrolling of myself that has been happening for all of my life and never being the person that could 
participate in the prescribed way um, and feeling and then over time developing obviously a very fractured sense of self and poor self-esteem and and then all the other associated habits and behaviors that go with that um, trying to grapple with that fracture I suppose um, and yeah I, as you said John that I think it's obviously apparent to anyone who is who kind of understands themselves as being autistic that um, the, the real issue is not um, uh, how can we modify ourselves to fit into the world it's like how can the world learn or begin to understand what it what the experience of being us is like and and then understand how to make the world just a bit more comfortable um, and uh, show some compassion that the and and just a sort of general understanding that you know our, our experience as a world doesn't need to be moderated doesn't need to be improved it's actually fine just as it is um, and that uh, you know it's it's enough it doesn't need to be improved or optimized yeah so i i think that i i would describe this as you know aba has this um desire to achieve some sense of normality in the sense of standardizing our behavior and and so i really like this this notion of hypernormativity and and that's i think what our society has become and what's very apparent to hypersensitive or autistic people uh, and that sense of hypernormality somehow ex escapes the well so-called normal population um so laura um yeah, so I, I, I've left you waiting, so I'm keen to hear your perspective. I, I thought let's hear all the others, and and you, you can sort of try and summarize, you know, what what you're hearing, and and uh, let, let us know what it means from your perspective, because I think you're working, you're you're specializing in in, in language, uh, and um, perhaps explain where you're coming from and how you relate to ABA. Yeah, well, I, I first would like to, to validate and uh, the, the, the opinions and, and thoughts that have already been expressed. I think you all shared wonderful first person perspective and uh, I really can't say anything better or uh, I don't in any way disagree with you. Here's what I have to say, which I'll keep brief, which is I think throughout history, there have been dominant ways of thinking about things or doing things in societies including in science. And I believe that ABA is a dinosaur. It is based on outdated ideas in science, the more innovative ways of thinking about the brain and cognition and behavior um, and personhood and identity. These ways of thinking have not yet imbued our thinking at, at the societal discourse level about autism. And I think that that is a, a terrible disservice and a damaging state of affairs. So I think we're living through a time of change. We're living through a time of reflection. I think we're living through uh, a time of, of a deep need for paradigm shift uh, with respect to ABA. So I look forward to the continuation of this discussion. Excellent. So I think uh, this, I yeah we've reached a good point now to tackle the second question, which uh, I, I think is the most logical question now to ask, uh, given that uh, we are seeing uh, a growing number of bans on conversion therapy for other uh, target groups or in the ABA lingo those would be client groups, right? Um, so uh, question is as follows. More than 50% of autistic people identify as non-heterosexual or non-gender uh, conforming based on current research. Um, this means that until we ban ABA for autistic children, conversion therapy uh, on uh, LGBTQ uh, children has not really been banned anywhere. I think that's an interesting um, line of uh, thought that, I mean, to us, I think it's very obvious. Again, I suspect outside the autistic community, people are completely unaware of that connection. 
Anyone want to start? Yeah, um, there, I'm in Toronto, Canada, and we have a local politician who um, is a lesbian and she recently announced, we have ba banned conversion therapy in Ontario. And I said, F you, you've banned gay conversion therapy, but ABA is the only provincially funded autism treatment in Ontario. And eventually she blocked me. Like, like okay, okay, we got, we got gay people taken care of, F off, you don't matter. And it, it just infuriated me so much. Um, yeah, and, and, you know, and a, a lot of people, a lot of autistic people are, are gay or transgender. And so you're not banning conversion therapy for those transgender and gay people. They're still getting it because they're autistic. And it, it's just it's just so disgusting the lack of solidarity between the LGBTQ community and the, the autistic community when it comes to banning conversion therapy properly. I wonder if I could just jump in there and respond. I I I, I hear the the stress and the um, I I myself am disgusted by uh, the, the the lack of awareness you know across different uh, ally groups. Um, I think that uh, um, there is a very natural reaction when seeing the lack of awareness to uh, feel betrayed, to feel how could you uh, not have uh, you know, caught up to speed in, uh, in, in this issue. Um, at the same time, I personally feel, uh, and based on a lot of research and a lot of evidence, that uh, personal stories are extremely powerful. Um, personal perspectives, the authenticity of speaking from your own life, from your own um, experiences um, are very persuasive and help people understand they are in, intrinsic to social learning. And it, the way forward, I think, will be for more influencers in different uh, um, uh, groups, especially um, those that uh, um, you know are slightly outside of the mainstream or have an advocacy um, uh, 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 opinion uh, uh, agent uh, uh, goal, um, as well as in science uh, policy, finding those influencers and sharing personal stories will be um, a great way forward. It's not just a lack of awareness though, because I go to these people and say, no, conversion therapy in general has not been banned. It's happening to autistic people. And here's the proof. And here's the guy who invoted, who invented both kinds. Of, and they're like, oh, F you. So that's not like a lack of awareness once we inform them and they still tell us to go F ourselves, so. Can I just step in here as well? And I wanna say um, that, like yeah that's the bizarre thing about it is it's not only is it not banned but it's actively funded by you know I, I like the New Zealand government is currently funding and it, you know it's prescribed in the autistic like you know guidelines that ABA is the preferred method to use on children so it's not like gay conversion therapy that's kind of like hidden away and you know, shushed about, and it's the like minority of people doing it. It's like the widely accepted thing to do, and also it is still the same, like you know, principles. So it's it's a it's a very like disturbing um, like setup that's currently going on. Um, Alice, this is interesting to hear. Can you um, clarify regarding the funding for ABA in New Zealand? Because I saw, I think a few years back, one of the ABA service providers try, ran a petition to, to, towards getting funding. And I think that wasn't successful. So my understanding was that, yes, it's prescribed sort of, or it's encouraged in the uh, uh, autism specter, spectrum, uh, disorder guideline by the government. Um, but uh, I was thinking that actually at this point, uh, I wasn't sure 
what level of active funding from the government there is. Can you clarify? I think you've got a son. So what was this suggested to you and uh, what did you learn? Well, basically I've been doing a bit of like investigation. So it, it's pretty much the, I've discovered that Autism New Zealand, which is like the largest charity mm. in New Zealand for autistic people or the autism community, um, as they like to call it, um, they are currently funded and the only people funded to provide early intervention. And what they've basically done is they've renamed ABA as um, a program called, um, they call it Early Start, I think. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those programs that's based pretty much, you know, they won't say it, but you know, all the principles and all the things that they're doing, the videos that you look at, you can see that their goals are things like increasing eye contact, increasing engagement. So yeah, uh, they uh, are actively funding. So, and it's super prescribed and that's does sitting there on the government website, you know, saying that ABA is the preferred thing to do. So mm -hmm. any parent who has suggested, um, you know, you know, you get your child, if you were to get your child diagnosed, Autism New Zealand is pretty much a first stop. They call themselves the one-stop shop for autism. Mm -hmm. um, and the next course of action, if you live in Auckland, it's currently only a one location that they're funded to do this. They want to roll it out nationwide. So, yeah. Mm. yeah and they're so saying that they're looking into it, but I'm not mm. sure who it is that's looking into it, who's making the decisions, given that they're funded for it. The Ministry of Education thinks that it's necessary. Um, mm -hmm. And also the fact that they are connected with, um, you know, behavioral therapists and yes. the people yeah, that yeah. work for them are also mm -hmm. qualified. And, and, and mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really care that much how the techniques look that are being used. I think that the, the challenge starts with the objectives as you illustrate you know things like eye, eye contact and other expected behaviors that are just part of the social cultural norms in our society that are incompatible with uh, autistic neurology um, it doesn't really matter what techniques you use to try and bring those behaviors to the surface as long as you're mandating them you're uh, violating the, the autistic person. Yeah, I agree. And so basically my conclusion is that it would be dangerous for me to um, even consider getting my son, you know, mm -hmm. looked at, diagnosed at the moment because I don't want him to be pushed mm -hmm. into that system by the Ministry of Education. Mm -hmm. So, so my conclusion is that what we are going to see is, you know, if we, uh, with things like bands of ABA, people are always going to sort of skirt around the edges, trying to achieve exactly the same objectives, just by slightly different means. And I think that's the real challenge here. Um, yeah, I, I agree, John. I, I mean, I'm just sort of thinking it through as, as a, Per, you know as an individual autistic individual and also as a parent and also with lots of you know three of my sisters have been through that process of um having diagnosis for their children and i'm not sure that they've gone through aba but they've certainly had you know early intervention programs which i'm sure in, include um elements of the, that process um I, I was listening to, sorry, what was your name, Laura? I think you were saying earlier, I think the storytelling component's really important from the sort of social and familial perspective because a, a parent always wants the best for their child. They want them to be able to succeed and be happy and um, eventually leave the nest. I suppose that's kind of what we consider to be the, the, the purposes of, of the, the role of a parent in society is to encourage independence and fulfillment for their child and, and achievement as well. And I suppose an interesting thing to think about is if not ABA, and I think this might follow into one of those questions that you, we had on the, the thread, John, is um, mm -hmm. what, what then? Um, what, do we, what do we offer parents and families of people with children who are obviously demonstrating all these signs of being autistic? Um, what tools and messages will we 
provide them with or communicate to them to, to let them know that this is a pathway that's actually humane and is going to result in better uh, better outcomes for their child in the long term. And I don't know what that is, <laughs> other yeah. than you know, and maybe that's something that's worth worth discussing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. I mean, you've uh, perfectly, I think, introduced the, the next question. So yeah, what are alternative ways of raising and educating children, right? And I think uh, we cannot divorce this question from what I said earlier about our hypernormative uh, society. Um, we have diversity and inclusion initiatives and workplaces, but we don't, our society actually doesn't appreciate uh, diversity. And we see this via this pathologization of so many uh, people, uh, and including, of course, the, the growing number of autistic people. So uh, I think the, it's, we have to educate parents. Uh, we have to uh, educate society. That we need to work on society directly. That's uh, where I see solutions on the horizon. It's broadening the scope of our educational system, which is stuck in, still stuck in the er mentality of the early days of the Industrial Revolution on the, you know, uh, what uh, I like to refer to the, the, the factory model of society where, where we are just uh, machines or cogs in, in the wheels. And uh, well, humans are a bit more diverse than that. Um, so I think the first step is probably about, yeah, educating uh, parents and then also making parents realize that if they have autistic children, um, well, these children actually can teach their parents a lot about themselves, if only the parents find ways of noticing their children, having the time for their children, and uh, finding ways of communicating with their children, let, letting their children guide them, instead of this, well, it's the industrial uh, metaphor again, instead of the assumption of, of parents that they are the ones who have to, uh, well, tell children what they're supposed to be in life. I might just jump in and, and say, uh, you know, as a communication professional, where science, that is my scientific specialty, uh, there are many, many different ways of communicating, uh, non-verbally, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, you know, with words, with some words, with unreliable words, uh, with emotion, uh, which may be hard for different people to read. Maybe this, the socially normative way of reading emotion is not going to apply in all cases. Mm -hmm. So. I just feel that uh, you know there there is a need for um, autistic advocates to share your authentic first person experiences to help broader society socially learn. You know, you are the experts, and uh, and and as parents, uh, our encounter encounter the narratives around autistic people's experiences, they will become more aware and educated about. Um, the strengths and you know the the um, the challenges of being autistic, um, where and and the individual paths that people take, um, and help uh, find a healthy way for them to relate to their child, which then they can advocate with for with speech language professionals who are going to be incredible advocates. I can tell you. I think I think you've made some excellent points. I'd like to add that. I got into a Twitter fight recently with this inane autism mom who was, I think, uh, I think Lyra, KK, neurodivergent rebel or someone else was talking about intrinsic motivation and how ABA kills intrinsic motivation and how children obviously learn by intrinsic motivation. And this autism mom, trademark, <laughs> said that, that my, my dumb little kid, that's too complex of a concept for my dumb little kid, as if, as if intrinsic motivation was some sort of complex learning system and not something natural. I said to her, toddlers, crawl around their home and they put everything in their mouths. That's intrinsic motivation to learn. Or if you as an adult all of a sudden become curious about a topic and you start searching about it on Google, that's intrinsic motivation. 
this whole idea that you need some sort of complex magic tricks to get kids to learn with, you know, rewards and punishments and like complex methodology and stuff like that is just totally absurd. And they make it way more complicated than it really has to be. I think the only major difference between teaching an autistic child and an holistic child is an autistic child may have sensory sensitivities that you need to, to help them with. An autistic child may not be verbal and you might need to offer them other forms of communication like AAC, sign language, et cetera. But aside from that, like autistic kids learn just the same way as other kids. And they just, they, they make it so complicated as if we're a different species or something. It's just, it infuriates me. Um, I'll just jump in there as well, if that's okay. And just say 100% agree. I think like basically um, if you do nothing, that's probably a better, you know, better way to go than what has currently happened. Like just leave them alone, like to start with. Um, I, it just, yeah, it's just, oh, sorry, I've just lost my train of thought, but like that, basically that's when you, when you get diagnosed as um, like an adult, the first thing that my, like um, the person who diagnosed me was like, go and read like stories of other autistic people and there's no cure or anything you need to do. Obviously, you just need to learn how to, to live and to do that. You talk to other autistic people. We don't need non-autistic people to stand as a barrier in these organizations between us, mm -hmm. you know, as if we can't talk to each other. Like that is the problem. We can't talk to each other because they're there stopping us from talking to each other. That's how it feels at the moment. So it's like, so I mean, all they need to do is like read a, uh, read a book that's written by an autistic person about how to look after their child. Like that's, yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, letting us be autistic, let it, letting children be autistic, uh, accepting that being autistic is being human. I mean, that would be a start. Uh, so just want to also point out, like they always use autism severity to try and justify ABA, um, but you can read, go online and read the words of like non-speaking autistic advocates and they will all tell you that they didn't like ABA and it didn't help them and instead it destroyed their relationship with their parents or you know just made them not want to live um, I think especially as well like the uniformity of our experience is, is like I've got tons in common with non-speaking autistic people like I read Naoki Higashida's book uh, mm. The Reason I Jump and I learned more about myself from a 13 year old at the time non-speaking autistic child than anyone else in my life had ever told me at that point and yeah I mean it's this idea that you know people are severe or intellectually disabled I think like in most cases that's not true they're just not making the effort to communicate with them in the way that they need to because they have apraxia or just some other neurological difference that means that they can't control their movement and uh, yeah it's I mean it's been really heartbreaking seeing the non-speaking advocates come out and say hey like we're here stop treating us like there's nobody home like yeah Rory, I had exactly the same experience reading that book. Um, it changed everything for me. Like it, <clears throat> reading that book was what made me understand that I was actually autistic. <laughs> um, even though, you know, from an exterior perspective, someone else would say that I was a highly functioning and extremely competent person who was able to achieve lots in society. But I felt exactly the same way as you. My interaction with the world and my sensory experience of understanding my place in the universe was extremely similar to this 13 year old nonverbal Japanese boy. Um, and so sort of joining that, I guess, one, one therapy that um, I found was useful for my son only in the sense that it kind of gave him a, it made him feel good in himself and, and about, you know, helped him because he's also, you know, if we're talking about diagnosis, he's also diagnosed as ADHD and dyspraxia with dyspraxia. And so he's, you know, very clumsy, has poor motor control, fine motor control. Um, we used a, an occupational therapist who used the 
green um, the greenspan floor time method, which when it comes down to it is really just about regulation, about how well a person is regulating themselves and regulating their emotion. And that obviously depends on the sensory inputs that are happening around them. So being able to respond to what your needs are and understanding what your needs are and modifying either your your um, participation in that environment or the environment to suit you. And then the other thing which I think that was essential to this approach was looking for the glint in the eye of the child. And you know, the little twinkle in the eye is that when you when you have that and when you when you when you have that exchange with another human being or an animal or whatever, you know that you are in communion. You know that communication and exchange is ready to take place. Um, and so it's it's using fun and play and um, uh, uh, kind of emotional ways of interacting rather than um, kind of rigid. Um, behavioral ways of reacting to encourage that moment of connection because that's essentially fundamentally as humans not just autistic humans all humans are looking to achieve is that essence of being connected and um, in communion with one another just a brief uh, comment to amplify rory's comments the notion of overly simplistic categories of severity being used as justification or premise for mandating ABA therapy is invalid, scientifically outdated, and damaging. Thanks. Um, I think uh, another comment uh, along, well, the, the reason we also should perhaps briefly discuss the reasons why um, people are so, uh, some people seem to be desperate to, to find some kind of therapy. I think a lot of that may have to do with the way our education system and the school system works. So when uh, parents have children, their expectation is, well, my ch child needs to succeed in school, needs to get an education. And that entire system is of course, not designed for autistic people. Uh, and so therefore, uh, I think some people may sort of end up panicking uh, if they notice that their child is not going to succeed by traditional measures in that kind of system. So the, I, I think uh, real progress will have to involve a radical rethink of large parts of what we call education. Um, yeah, I totally agree with that. In fact, that is something that um, someone's already said to me is that that would be a good motivation for me to um, look at getting my son diagnosed. Um, but I would counter that and I did counter that with, you know, if he's not going to fit in the school system and that's going to be, you know, if he's going to have to change and be something he's not, then I'm not going to put him in that system and I will homeschool him instead if it's necessary or I'll find a school that actually works for him. I know there's one in um, Nai Nai, I've heard it's very good. Yeah, this is this is a huge problem. Like school is literally the thing that taught me so many incorrect lessons about who I was. Um, I mean, I had dyscalculia and dysgraphia, so I couldn't write or do math. So, and that was basically everything that they assist you on were like when I was going through school. Um, and so I just thought I was, I thought I was, and I got reinforced that I was stupid and I asked stupid questions and just everything about it. Like the way that the autistic mind works is different to how the, like just a standard brain works. Like my, my mind works by relating things to other things that I already know. Like it's just about forming connections between what are seemingly disparate fields. Like, and I always got told off for veering off subject. Like, and that was like one of the biggest things. And then I don't know, like now we're starting to get systems theory as the emerging thing in science being like, hey, we can't look at all of these fields in isolation. We actually have to look at the whole picture. And that's where psychology is moving now as well. It's like being, oh, we focused way too much on the individual rather than finding what are the other causes. Like it can't just be that people are getting more anxious and depressed, like as anxious and depressed people, it's gotta be, there's gotta be more underlying causes for what's causing this. And yeah, I mean, 
it's it's really weird we teach we teach so many things but we don't teach things like philosophy which teach you how to think like or like get you to analyze you know why something is a good or bad idea or what you're being taught is you know could this potentially be colored with bias or yeah so I mean, I basically got out of my education and then had to spend the next 10 years trying to actually learn what the truth was because everything that I'd been taught was just white, like cis, patriarchal. Like, and I went to Auckland Boys Grammar, which is just the most like rigid, horrible, dated, like stuck in the 1920s, uh, has core subjects that, that, that you have to do. And yeah, I mean, basically, there was no liberty in my education, and all of the stuff that I was interested in wasn't available as an academic subject. So, yeah, it was just painful. My, my experience of dealing with the education system in Australia has been pretty woefully um, uninspiring. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've chosen to mainstream educate our son. Um, I suppose just because, you know, it's, it's really hard to work against those systems, you know, because you yourself have got to find money to work and it's, it's, it's really difficult. Like it is like, you know, I think this is part of the problem with the autistic mind is that it can't, it can't separate one thing from another. It has to think about everything all at once. And therefore it's really difficult to, um, try and fix one aspect of something without them knowing that there's always deficits in other areas. But the 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 level of understanding about autism and and neurodiversity in in children in the public education system in Australia is very very poor. Um, and we've had we actually changed schools recently, and there are some schools that are much better than others. And we've been lucky to go to a new school that's has a um, has a speech pathologist working at the school so at least people who have some understanding of the um, you know what what these presentations even mean and how they might affect a child's learning um, but I had a the vice principal of the school writing a report that you know our son didn't in, um, didn't enjoy writing um, because it's something oh no, he doesn't do much writing because it's something he doesn't enjoy and it's like well, he, you completely failed to understand, it, it, you know, entirely who he is or what he's able to do because he just has difficulty holding the pencil or the pen. That's the issue. He doesn't not enjoy it. He, um, he's keen to express himself, but this is it. Like they're all just looking for the outcomes rather than the ideas or the, um, the information behind the person or inside the person. I think what you mentioned there is an excellent example of how deeply or, or not deeply uh, educators and, and teachers sometimes engage with children, right? I mean, this level of superficiality, I mean, it, it, it highlights where the real problem is. Um, and why do we all have to go through this highly standardized education system? I mean, people talk about diversity, uh, on paper, organizations are happy to say, yeah, we need diversity, it's essential for yeah. uh, progressing in all kinds of fields. And, and yet in practice, we don't see it. There is this uh, cultural bias against it. And, and this, this entirely, I think, uh, dividing up the world into disciplines uh, is no longer quite appropriate. I mean, the internet certainly doesn't work that way and neither do, do humans, uh, neither individually nor uh, collectively. Um, so uh, I'm just conscious of time. The next question I think could be a good uh, continuation here. So I'll read it out. Um, what do we mean by a comprehensive ban on all forms of conversion therapies? Uh, ABA, for example, has applications with a wide variety of so-called client groups, including those with intellectual and other disabilities, childhood onset behavioral disorders, and brain injury, rehabilitation, and dementia care. And of course, you can add autism to that list. So this description I just read comes straight from a university uh, uh, webs, web page uh, on ABA. So that's the official scope of ABA. Uh, and uh, so I think I would 
like to discuss, you know, how far do we, uh, uh, what are we really asking for with a ban? And um, does it stop with autistic people or how, you know, how far does it need to go? Um, I've got, I, I guess, uh, a sort of a talking point, I suppose, that kind of expands on that. I think um, what I'm noticing is that all of these organisations that are involved, whether it's a school, you know, Autism New Zealand, um, Ministry of Education, they all need to create measurables, basically. So they need a goal and they need to be able to measure that and that proves that everything's working. So that kind of goes across all of these groups. So if, if you've got someone, you know, who's intellectually disabled, um, the measurable is going to be something like they are having fun and smiling more. Like that's literally what it is. I've worked in one of these organisations. That's what they measure stuff on. Like that shouldn't be what they're measuring on. And I think that, that if we can get like break that down and um, and really like stop that from happening, stop measuring based on what things appear to be to people who aren't, you know, involved and maybe talk to the actual people and say, how are things for you? Are they improving or are they not? Then we might go some way to actually stop it from happening. Um, but the current system of, of everything being based on, you know, professionals or experts who are experts in autism, but not actually autistic um, and experts in, you know, every other thing that they can come up with that will make money off of us, basically. Yeah, I think to banning ABA, like on a general level, it's just presuming that people have competence, like that is the number one thing. So, I mean, with all of these groups that you've mentioned, like there's an underlying definition in society that these people don't have agency, like they can't think for themselves. So we have to do it for them. And that's kind of the underlying principle. So, I mean, yeah, with intellectually disabled people, they usually know what they want to do. Like I've talked to tons, like they know what they want, like, and then it's because it's not something that, I mean, and for sure for like, problematic stuff like where they are injuring themselves or others that is like something that you can work with them on but you need to find out the reasons that they're doing it first which is something that's never asked like they just start trying to fix their behavior without finding out the motivation for the behavior and I mean this this is like in ABA research last year they they basically were trying to get a child used to their sensory sensitivities uh with uh sound which is one that's super common across all autistic people is that we have a higher sensitivity to sound and they did this by locking him in a like three by three room and just playing ridiculously loud like crying baby noises and stuff that is known to actually upset people and then it just reminded me of you know like the uh, clockwork orange movie like that's literally what they were doing to him it's just and apparently that's ethical, like that passes university ethics committees. So I think, yeah, I mean, we need to start respecting that people are different. Like that, that is the underlying thing. Like just some people are different. They don't, they don't conform to normal standards and that's okay. Like mm -hmm. the society always preaches individualism, but the second that individualism shows up, they're like, no, be like, be like a collective in this one way. Yeah, it's, it's about social power. It's about control, the desire to manage people. And um, I think the conclusion that I'm drawing is uh, this, this whole uh, well, society has become very well, dehumanizing. De so uh, functioning in standardized ways is appreciated more than the ability to develop trusted relationships. And people have become time poor. So, I mean, when I write about society, I write about this cult of busyness that we've created. Um, and uh, this means 
People don't feel they have time to attend to children. They don't have time to attend to disabled people. They don't have time to uh, 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 spend with, with uh, old people who may require care uh, and, and, and just human contact. And so we're trying to commoditize everything. Uh, and uh, so again, I think we can uh, put as autistic people in a, we are in an excellent position at putting, holding up a mirror to society and, and just throwing up these questions. I mean, we don't need to pretend to have all the answers. I mean, I, I think I've got a number of good ideas, but uh, first step to, to collectively uh, changing something in society is to recognize that we've got severe problems at a social level and not at an individual level. I think that was stated wonderfully, Soren. The burden is on society now to change, to accommodate. And the, the, my conclusion therefore is that there is no use case for ABA or, or, or similar therapies. This desire to control and manage people has gone far, way too far. Um, and we need to pedal back. back. Abolish capitalism. Yeah, I mean, I, this is another interesting big discussion. I mean, if uh, we will, I mean, in the autistic community, as you know, we're having these discussions all the time. Uh, you know, if you do polls uh, amongst autistic people, of course, our outlook on society is very different from the norm. and. Um, I, I think we've long concluded that, uh, that the current economic uh, ideology is completely inappropriate. Uh, but, uh, and I think this is why we're getting that much pushback, right? Because uh, there are very powerful vested financial interests that absolutely are against uh, these strong, powerful voices that you know, can even you know, logically reason uh, why so many things are broken in society. I mean, we actually uh, can, well, there's so much, the, the evidence is overwhelming. And there is, what I'm seeing is there, are, we now have you know, the way our company organizes and I'm connected with many other alternative uh, or people who are involved in organizations that operate very differently from the mainstream paradigm. And, and, and this is an emerging uh, trend, uh, which, from the perspective of mainstream society is probably highly concerning. Um, but, uh, uh, and you, you can see this in here, even with COVID and the pandemic, uh, the initially people noticed that, oh yeah, well, actually all this busyness, maybe we don't need all of that, but uh, uh, one year later and uh, Busyness interests and the politicians are all about getting back to so called normal. Um, next question. Oh, uh, sorry, anyone else have comments uh, on the previous question? So, how far does a ban need to go? So, I guess if I understand correctly, we're saying we don't want these techniques to apply, be applied to anyone, right? Not just the autistic children. And sorry, yeah, just to, on this, like the International Federation for Dog Trainers is like, they don't allow behavioral therapy. They're like, you need to respect the dog. Like we, we've been doing so many things wrong, like this is inhumane. And that same level of care is still not applied to people. Like, and it's, yeah, I mean, these are the things that if it's, if you wouldn't do it to a dog, why are you doing it to people? Like anyone, like. That is remarkable. Do you have a link that you could share yeah, yeah. to the chat window? I'll, I'll, I'll drop it in the chat. Thank you for that. So I, I'm just noticing we've run out of time, but I think uh, we've covered quite a bit of ground. And I hope that the recording worked as it should have. So we, we should have a good uh, record of all of this. And thank you very much for your time. Um, we're coordinating further panels. So if you have time available to participate in another uh, panel, please let me know. And uh, we'll just need to find ways to uh, continue our campaigns. I think 
autistic perseverance is our, one of our biggest strengths. Um, and uh, at least, well, yeah, let's make as much progress as we can. And uh, it'd be nice to see if we can get ABA banned in New Zealand, and then we can focus on our attention on uh, preventing the same techniques uh, from popping up under other uh, names. Thank you so much, Thanks John. It's been much. a pleasure. Likewise. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll see you all thank again. You. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Talk soon. See ya.